what are some of the symptoms of the relationship if somebody's in a narcissistic dynamic within the context of that? Well, something that's going to show up relatively early in the game and love bombing can last anywhere from six to eight months. But even during the love bombing phase, you're going to see the slipping in of gaslighting, right? Because ultimately a narcissistic relationship is a power play. That's what it is. And they, their motivation in a relationship is power, dominance, control. Your motivation in a relationship may be love, affection, and closeness. You ain't playing the same game. So they're trying to dominate you. And gaslighting is one of the best ways to do that with someone, right? You destabilize their reality, then you destabilize them by telling them there's something wrong with them. Rinse, lather, repeat. You do that enough times, a person completely loses, they're, they're completely doubt themselves. Why? Because they love the person. If you started to gaslight me, I don't know you well enough. I'd be like, I'll just turn off my computer. I'm like, I'm out. But if we were close to each other, if you're a family member, if you're a partner, if you're a good friend, I would have a connection. I'd have an attachment and I'd want to continue maintaining that, right? So to maintain that, I'm going to make allowances. And what might I do? Maybe they didn't mean that. Maybe I did put the keys in the wrong place. Maybe I did never say that. Maybe I'm just being too suspicious. And slowly but surely, the person being gaslighted starts to internalize responsibility for anything that's going wrong in the relationship. So that's probably one of the most insidious dynamics, and it shows up early. A gaslighter is testing the water. If you know what gaslighting is and you kind of start stepping away at the relatively early signs of it, the relationship isn't going to last long. But because people are often enjoying the, the love bombing phase, they're enjoying getting to know someone who's charming, charismatic, attractive, confident, like that's not bad stuff. So you have a person who has all these goodies and then they start doing this gaslighty stuff. We sometimes make excuses to keep the good stuff rolling, right? So that's one pattern that'll show up. You'll also see other kinds of these power plays and sort of, you know, unhealthy patterns. They'll be invalidation. They'll make you small so they can be big. Right. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, you went to that school. No, it, it sounds like it was cool. Like, you know, my school, we, in my job, we, in this, I did, you know, so it's always sort of, yeah, I'll acknowledge that, but let me tell you what I did. And so there's a lot of invalidation, even a sense of dismissiveness or minimization. Your problems aren't that big a deal. You think you have problems. Let me tell you about this. You often feel in these relationships, either you're trying to measure up to some weird standard they have, or you're trying to win them over. You're trying to earn them and so like earn their love. And that gets tricky for people who might have an early history of these kinds of relationships. So if a person grew up with a narcissistic or invalidating or antagonistic or kind of toxic parent, these patterns are kind of not only sort of very much in your nervous system and in your body, when they start happening again, this is old school for you. And so it's easy to fall into those patterns again. Um, it's not unusual for narcissistic people to betray your trust. They, it might not be as much as that they're cheating on you early in the relationship, but they might still be being shady on social media and they'll come up with all kinds of brilliant or gaslighty excuses. And so you start feeling like you're the one who's paranoid and weird and they continue doing shady stuff. And so you're forever sort of in this haze and never quite able to exhale sort of in the relationship. They're argumentative and they're really good at arguing. It's back to the power play. So some people will say, you know, I used to like getting into a healthy argument, but this isn't that. This is sort of being overwhelmed and someone feeling like they're coming at me like a tidal wave. There's a lot of dysregulation in these relationships. So the narcissistic folks go from zero to 60 in one second. They're very dysregulated with their anger. And that anger comes about when they have an ego injury. And an ego injury can be caused when they don't feel special. So that might be that somebody disrespected them at work that day and you had nothing to do with it. It could be that they didn't get the parking spot they wanted. It could be that there was traffic. It could be that their friend got to go on a really cool vacation and they didn't. You don't know what's going to set off that ego injury. But what we do know is that it returns into rage and a rage that might come at you even if you're not responsible. You're not the one. You're not the reason they had the bad day at work. And a lot of people are like, what is happening? So now you're living in a minefield. You don't know what's going to set them off. You're tiptoeing and you're doing the proverbial walking on eggshells. That was the name of the book, actually. Walking on eggshells is a great book. It's written by um, a woman named Randy Krieger. She's she's been writing this space for us. She talks more specifically about borderline personality styles. And she she I mean, it's it's it really was a seminal book in the field because you know what Randy Krieger did? She was one of the first ones, especially with borderline where it's harder to do it, to say, whoa, 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 whoa. 
you realize everyone else is adjusting their behavior for these folks. And that's not cool. It was, it was a courageous leap in and people like me were able to come in afterwards and talk about these other personality styles. So do you think there's any hope for somebody who's in a relationship with a narcissist? Let's say somebody's listening to this or they're watching this and they're like, oh my gosh, like I think, I honestly think I might be in a relationship with a narcissist. Is there any conversation that can be had with, with this person? Can a narcissist change or is the best way of survival to get out? So it depends on the person. Doug, this is where it gets really complicated. And my approach to this has always been to have no agenda to say, well, if you don't get out, then it's really going to always be a nightmare for you. It's not true, right? Healing's an inside game, right? It's something we can take responsibility for in ourselves, even if we're in a mess. That you know, healing is possible even when getting out is not, is what I tell folks. There's a lot of people, reasons people feel they can't get out of these relationships. There's the complex trauma bonded dynamics, but there's also, they still love the person for how difficult it's been. They still feel a sense of love. They feel a sense of loyalty. They have a sense of fear of if I leave this, what if they turn around and become a nice person for the next person, or there's still some stuff I like here. I don't want to be alone. There is practical factors. Uh, practical factors could be money, a shared home. You might have kids together. And then there's cultural and religious factors. People feeling like, I, especially if it's they're married, they feel like, okay, I can't split up with this person. I'm in it with them, whatever it may be. No reason is a wrong reason. There's no judgment or shame around the reasons. Your reasons are yours and they're real. And I think this idea like, oh, that's just because you're lame and you're a doormat. There are no doormats. These things do such a number on you. And if you still feel love for a person, you still feel love for a person. No one else gets to tell you you don't. So what the hope then becomes, and it's all to me predicated on radical acceptance. You got to see this thing for what it is and know it's not going to change. And what tiny bit it changes, it ain't going to be enough to make this a healthy relationship. Right. And so I can put, you know, listen, I could put crown molding in my house. Don't make it a mansion. All right. Makes it a house with crown molding. And you, they might change a little bit. It doesn't make them into an empathic, warm, loving kind of a person. And so not the way somebody needs. Now, some people will say, listen, this fool went to therapy and they don't scream as much and it's still not deep. And I have to radically accept that's not what I'm getting in my life. But radical acceptance is that this person's not going to change or it's not going to change enough. The relationship's not going to change. The patterns in the relationship aren't going to change and that this is going to be hard. And it will still hurt even if they say things to you. So, but over time, some people say, you know what? We live in parallel here. You know, we just shot a video today about this idea that some people are fully mentally out, but they're physically in. Is it optimal? Eh, I mean, who's to argue, right? They'll say there's reasons I'm staying in this. If they left tomorrow, I'd be thrilled, but I can't, I can't be the one who pushes the accelerator on that. And I'll tell you, there's people who quote unquote, get out of narcissistic relationships, but they're mentally still in. It's almost like being a dry drunk, right? They're still mentally in the game. And so they're scanning and social media and who are they with and what are they up to? Some people are in the relationship like, I don't give a damn what happens to this person. I'm out. So radical acceptance is really a key, but it also fills people with grief. They're like, I love this person. I thought we were going to grow old together. I thought this, I thought that. Having to give up on all that is hard. Now for the people who leave, it's a different path forward and it ain't all rainbows and, and moonbeams. In some cases, narcissistic people don't like to be left. Let's call it that straight. They do not. They have high rejection sensitivity. So if somebody leaves them, there will be hell to pay. So there might be what we call post-separation abuse. The narcissistic person may stalk them on social media or even literally the narcissistic person may pass rumors about them. They might do us what we call a smear campaign. They may enlist what are called flying monkeys. They talk smack about the person who broke up with them to anyone who will listen. And some of those people will start to believe it. So you'll feel like your entire support system crumbled overnight. So that's, so these things happen where you think like, I was just trying to break up for them, but now my whole life is kind of a mess. And so people will sometimes feel as though, what have I done? This is this is worse now. Some people will break up and feel a sense of regret. So when the narcissistic person hoovers them back in, they're vulnerable to it. And so there, it, it's a complex landscape, even if people leave. In the grand scheme of things, Doug, if someone could leave, and be narcissist free or get rid of this person and really work, do the work of themselves, they will feel better, but people can heal while they're in these relationships. I've seen it happen. It happens all the time. I always say it's like, you're still walking, but now there's a bit of a slope on the walk, but it can be done. 
it's not the same, but there's similarities between this type of relationship dynamic and then being in a relationship with somebody who's an addict, right? Where you have to gain this radical acceptance. Like you said, you have to take care of yourself. You can't let the relationship destroy you. You can't create this you know, false idea of what the relationship could be. Like you have to accept it for what it is. And if things get better, awesome. But if not, like you have to accept like it's not your fault. And I've seen people completely self-sabotage in when they're in relationships with somebody who's an addict and it, and it ends up impacting their own mental health, their own life. And the same thing I would imagine happens in a narcissistic relationship and probably it's, it's it, I would imagine it's more severe. How can somebody prevent that? Like if, if they're, if they've gained radical accept, acceptance of the situation, what are some things that they should be doing on a daily basis, weekly basis? Again, I know you're not about like, this one size fits all approach, but generally speaking, what can people do to make sure that they're not sacrificing their mental health? So once a person hits radical exams, and listen, not everyone has access to therapy, but if you do be in it and ideally with a therapist who gets this stuff, because just simply having that, that validating space with somebody who's a trained ear can make a huge difference. And you also want to be shoring up your other social supports. Something that makes us very gaslightable is if in, in all the relationships we're in, our reality is being denied or twisted and we're being told there's something wrong. It's all our relationships are destabilizing. That makes it tricky. But if you you have validating spaces in your life, for example, a strong friendship network or trusted colleagues, just continuing to cultivate that because the narcissistic relationship is like a black hole. It sucks all of you into it, all your resource, all your bandwidth, all your, all your thoughts, feelings, everything. If you can, radical acceptance means thinking, I am not, I'm no longer bringing my A game to this relationship, right? I'm going to have to cultivate these other spaces in my life because these people see me, I see them. It's a mutual and reciprocal relationship. You get to experience that two-way road that is a relationship. You know, again, like I said, being in, in therapy is also a big one. The other thing is, is practicing realistic expectations. Radical acceptance and realistic expectations sort of go together hand in hand in the sense that the radical acceptance sort of navigates the realistic expectations where, where it's sort of things like the person who is about to have their birthday and things, they know that the narcissistic person, it's hit or miss if they're going to celebrate it right. If this matters to you that much, set something up with your friends. It could be a lunch. It could be a dinner. Like you need to do you. I, I, I say to people, I'm never going to be able to take away the hurt while you're in this relationship, but I would like to take away the surprise. And I have clients who week over week will say, you're not going to believe what he did. And I, I look at them. I'm like, I absolutely believe what he did. This I would have set a clock that this is what he would have done. And we'll even play a game because they'll say, I'm going to be doing this and this when I see my mother or narcissistic mother, narcissistic partner. I say, here's how it's going to go down. I'll make a bet with you. Won't bet stuff like a coffee or like Starbucks or something. I'll say, I'm right. You buy me Starbucks. I'm wrong. I buy it for you. I got nothing but Starbucks gift cards in my house because I am always right about this. And it's not that I'm some kind of damn genius. It's that's the, and I want to lift a surprise. But the more we play that game, they're like, I saw it. And I didn't react to it this time because the surprise leaves you feeling worn down and let down. You're like, I can't believe he did it versus it's more of like, here we go. You know, that's a very different nervous system stance. Another other thing is also to learn your nervous system. We might be fighters. We might be flighters. We might be freezers. We might be submitters. We might be fawners. Know your, your sort of nervous system repertoire. How do you respond to those threats? Because those often predominate. Some people feel shame, like, why didn't I say something? Their freeze response kicked in. And it's learning that self-compassion of you were trying to keep yourself safe in what felt like a threat. It is about bringing self-compassion to yourself. But doing these things sort of all together, engaging differently, you might say, well, that's not a relationship anymore. I don't disagree, but some people don't have a choice. But now it clears out a space for them to at least not be pummeled all the time psychologically.